get my students to buy into the idea, hey, you're going to be the high paid math consultant. Yeah. Here we go. Here's an opportunity to be the math consultant. Before we move forward, I believe I can just confirm that. Uh, disregard. Let's give you a little bit more details first. <laughs> Okay, so we're going to um, try this format. It's kind of like a protocol, a lesson in three acts. So we, we want to start off with a guess. You've read the problem. Now, what do you think? Just from reading this information, a hypothesis. What are you thinking? Which vehicle would you recommend just off of the information you have right now? Okay, then we're going to give you a little bit more. I know, and I'm going to go a step further, and I'm going to ask you, Discreetly, somewhere on this letter, write down. Right now, what, what do you think it's going to be? Is it one or the other? Write it down. Why? Because that's committing your brain to something. Now your brain wants to know. Right? I, I want to know because I'm waiting on my little burst of dopamine. We are hardwired. If we're willing to actually make the guess, now our brain wants to follow through and know if we're. Am I right? Am I right? Sorry, Shannon. Okay, so after you've made your guess, we're going to give you a little bit of more information. We've got a few reading articles, we've got some data um, that we're going to give you. So we'll give you a little bit more information so you can do a little bit more research to add to your <coughs> base knowledge that you already have. And with that information, then you're going to work with a group to actually find out and come up with an answer to the question. Okay, and like I said it before, it's not necessarily about the answer, but how did you come to it? What happened? What's playing into the reason you got the answer you did? Because we're going to have multiple groups, and you probably all are going to come up with different answers. Okay. Uh -huh. And then uh, Act 3 is going to be where we write, what could we account for in the air, and um, we're going to come back together as a group to discuss how did we do what we did, and why did you come up with this, and why did we come up with that? Okay. So the wrap-up at the end is important. <coughs> so we'll pass out... Um, So don't forget, we missed it. Now that everyone said there was MPs and MEA, but it's not my teacher association group in the state. And then, so, so this is still this, this process. This is the, um, the, the diagram, the model for the cycle for the modeling um, conceptual domain. This is actually from page 47, 67, Common Core State Standards. Just grabbed it right out of there. We've got the problem. Now we have to formulate an idea, a model, something. And we'll, we'll do some computations along the way. This is where most of us are always stuck. We're always doing this in our math classes, but we're ignoring every other piece of this great cycle. So yeah, we'll do some computations. We have to interpret our results. And then like, oh, OK, after we try to interpret our results, this is valid, it's reasonable. Maybe we have to go back to the cycle. And then finally, when we feel solid, we'll report out. But even at that stage, informally, just within our own teams, maybe maybe someone else will pick something out like that might send us back into the cycle a little more. So be focusing. It's not all some random, random thing. Um, before you start reading these articles, now <laughs> we're going to have even more fun and make you move around and get you out of your comfort zones. We need to count off by fives. Go. Um, two. Sorry. Three. Four. Five. Six. Or one. <laughs> Two. Three. Four. Five. One. Two. Three. Four. Five. Remember that. One. Two. Three. Four. Five. One. Two. All right. Um, we've got five tables. Go to them. Two's right here. Five's over here. One over here. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> of course it's on the other 
maybe if you get lucky, you don't have to pay for anything, but in a 10 car fleet, you'll probably have to replace at least one, and this is lowballing um, the, the cost there, versus a gas battery, which is fairly expensive. Uh, you do have some tax credits for your purchase, that's just a one time uh, bump to your hybrids there. Uh, maintenance, this is all assuming works as spec sheet um, describes, but we're in Florida, and you're going to be running the AC nonstop. And there's a good chance you may not even see any electric use. You might be entirely on gas this entire time, in which case you have all these additional expenses on top of that. Um, looking for the yeah, charging stations, um, surprisingly kind of sparse in Florida, so there's a, that's again kind of a non-numeric concern. That's just kind of a, a question of like they're talking about image, what are you willing to put up with. Um, and then we had no information about whether, uh, we know gas cars can do this, but can a hybrid car, will there space for a dead lady up top? Um, this company is very concerned with that. The Griswold, yeah, got it. The grandma in the rocking chair. And the dog training. The dog. The dog. The dog. The dog. Yeah, we just don't know. Does it have the power to grab? Yeah, exactly. And that's what like. It's low core, so. Yeah, low core. Uh, so, again, per year here. Best case scenario, assuming that you're getting a hybrid in an ideal situation, they're about even, but we don't think that's realistic. Uh, we, we thought that the hybrids were really at a disadvantage, and again, numerically, you're probably going to want to go with the gas. If there's other concerns, um, that's up for Mr. Griswold to decide, but... And then, I did some more research. Um, to charge your fleet of 10 vehicles, we'll presume, for the year, it's about $400 a year per car in electric, electricity bills. And then if you go to um, charging stations, it pays, some of them you have to pay a fee by the hour, however long you're charging your car. And I don't even know how long it takes to charge a car. So um, some of them charge by per kilowatt hour. Some just charge a flat session fee. Um, and some of them are free. I don't know of the 630 public charging stations in Florida, how many of them charge or are free and where they're located in Florida. So those are additional costs and things to consider. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so we actually spent 20 minutes talking about the, the logistics and ergonomics and flow of actually having electric vehicles. So we really don't have too much as far as mathematics wise, well, because um, we had way too many concerns prior to uh, with the electric powered vehicles. So uh, based on a very very reliable R square value of 0.77 that came up with an average of three dollars and two cents just to because it's super reliable. I'm joking. <laughs> <laughs> um, so so what we came up with is that like your initial cost is roughly three hundred fifty thousand dollars based on the initial cost of cars as well as the two hundred thousand miles that you'll be putting on all ten of these cars. Um, and gas is right around $100,000 cheaper. So if you look at just the two, the two biggest concerns of being initial costs, as well as how much gas you're using, slash how much it's going to cost, I actually played around with a couple different Excel graphs and found out that gas would have to be roughly $30 a gallon in order for us to actually get some sort of cost efficiency, and that only actually saved you about $1,400. So, um, I don't know what other concerns we had that we didn't talk about, or that we talked about. Yeah, that other people have Which is interesting because several years ago when gas was kind of creeping up to five bucks a gallon ish, and hybrids were kind of hot sellers, especially in California, and at only five bucks. So mm -hmm. that $30 a gallon is an interesting uh, figure. But, uh, 
is that at base, a lot of people say that five dollar point is the is the tipping point to make hybrids more popular in America. That, well, you kind of wonder too, like what was, that's, what was that point that we were kind of just we didn't really think about you know costs of replacing the batteries and the potential of being burned by acid to get into a car ride. Um, <laughs> You know, like the availability of power, how much it's going to cost monthly, yeah. And then, so even if like you had had that car for ten years, how much is it actually going to save you? Thank you. All right, so we uh, we got a couple graphs here. This graph below, we found out. We broke it down per car. Try to guess how many gallons we use over that five year period per car. So this, um, the x-axis is the cost of gas, and the y-axis is, um, so the intercept is how much each car costs. And then as we, um, based on 100,000 miles, and based off gas prices, we found per car, that um, if gas prices were about nine dollars a gallon, they'd equal out um, going 100,000 miles. And, and that's then, assuming we're not running the air conditioning all the time. And yeah, that's something. the optimal. There's a lot of people in Florida. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> optimal gas usage based on that chart. Mm -hmm. um, so this graph we predicted on what gas would cost. We found out the a quadratic fit was pretty good. And we thought between three to five would be a good range of gas prices. And so if you look at our graph from three to five, um, the green line being the gas powered, the blue line being the electric, like there's a pretty big difference. So, but there are like some groups mentioned the tax credits. So that could drop this Y intercept down a little bit based off tax credit what you spend initially per car. You just said between three and five. Three and five what? Oh, three and five dollars per gallon. Yeah. Three hours. Mm -hmm. I like the way that you guys uh, did that, where you can, you can see it based on the, yeah. on the gas prices, because we had to <clears throat> go back in and change our equations and, and recalculate everything for every dollar value that we wanted to look at. Uh, but now, mm -hmm. Yours, you can see it uh, based on the dollar value. Ours had, we could see it based on the mileage. When would they be equal? Mm -hmm. And yours is, uh, is yes, yeah, so that's it. That's it. Mm -hmm. And that is the most volatile set of data right there. Yeah, I mean, we're a lot of people. We all try to predict what gasoline prices are, but you know that's pretty cool. Um, 
the perception was in the back that you guys just did your own thing for a little while and uh, all came up with your own and then came and discussed it. <coughs> so that was, it was interesting how all four groups kind of did their own thing. <coughs> so, and then we felt that a lot of things took place, a lot of mathematical principles took place in here, but one, three, five kind of stood out to us. So um, make sense of the problem and persevere. Uh, Construct viable arguments. We felt like a lot of that was the initial conversation on how to set set your data, and then five use your tools. Everybody jumped on their Samsung phone, and others jumped on their Apples and Desmos and just different different stuff. To, uh, some people had paper and were drafting it that way. So appropriate tools. We thought was interesting. Uh, what did we hear? We heard some funny things like, are we allowed to include 2014 and 15 gas data? Um, can we do this? Can we make these assumptions? So there was a lot of that discussion. And then uh, there was a lot of non-math factors which we thought were interesting. Um, just the, the marketing. What does it look like? What does our company's moral compass say we should do with cars versus versus the pure dollars and cents sort of thing? So um, we thought that was a bit of abstract reasoning there, taking in some outside factors. And then uh, what did it do to your student engagement, your engagement in the task? I think everybody stayed pretty engaged. Uh, maybe because you're competitive, maybe because you like jumping in and graphing the data differently. Who can come up with the best data? So, anyways. Maybe again. that hard math though. I mean, different but then they did the, the thing, they saw it was quadratic and they found the different functions and that was different. So each group had a different approach to the math involved. There was a lot of different technologies. Yeah. I was seeing people on their phones on Desmos and then on the computers, Googling, and then you guys used Excel. I mean, there's a whole lot going on. I use my TI. You know, there is that math involved. How many of us were traditionalists? We get stuck and we think this is the math. Isn't this the math? And this is what we overlook because we were trained. We're going to solve a whole bunch of equations, and you're going to get that answer: x equals seven by The same way that your teacher shows you. This, this, this is the math. <laughs> the asking the questions, the researching, the testing. <clears throat> Not just that. And I think I think that's hard for us. It's, it's hard for me for sure, because because I was trained. This was math class. So, maybe that's the one I wanted to draw 
about that. This was all that. For me, that brings me back to what I was talking about earlier as far as assessment and what we're preparing them for. I mean, I think this is great stuff, but but is that if we spend too much time doing this, are they going to be able to answer the questions they need to on on, a, on the ACT test? You know, I mean, or and I, I don't know. So to be truly career and college ready, does that mean they're just able to pass the ACT? I, or what, I is it, what does more, it mean to be truly career and college ready? Well, I think if they're proficient problem solvers and they can get to that step where they can interpret it <coughs> and validate, like, even if they are struggling with a concept on the ACT and that's not something that maybe they were really exposed to, that they can kind of struggle their way through it and be like, okay, well, I've seen a situation kind of like this before, and problem solve their way to a solution. Um, I, I think that it, it increases just those test taking skills in being able to answer the standardized questions. If they are proficient problem solvers and they know they're they're good at doing this process, um, <coughs> that the testing will follow with that. I imagine yes. the ACT is that problem solving concept. And it's just some of the questions we were looking at. There were four levels that it could be approached at. They could do the fourth grade level of math on one problem and get the right answer, or they could do the you know, quadratic equation and get the same answer. So it's not the math they're doing as the ability to see is their answer the correct answer. And they don't get that if all they learn is to do the algorithms. You know, given a thousand algorithms and they have to pick the right one, it's not going to work given a question and know I have five different algorithms that might work, which one's good, they're more likely to do better than the memorization version of it. They won't do well on the ACT if they can't do this stuff. No matter how many of those yeah. 89 problems they did, the naked math problems, that, that won't get a good ACT score. There, I got to use the word naked. <laughs> <laughs> We're certainly not saying that. I mean, we still have to be content based. There's a lot of content. What has been helpful for me? I'm trying lightly. Appendix A, because it's really nice. Common Core split up beautifully K through eight. If you check out Appendix A, I feel these are my own words. My feet. Then I finally see. Oh, I'm teaching now for one course. Here are my non-negotiables. So then it, it gives me a clear path. Here's, here's what I must do. I don't have to do all that extra rah, that's listed in an algebra textbook. Here are my non-negotiables. And if you're looking in your standard document, Appendix A is not there. <laughs> it's a separate document that we can it's definitely there. provide to you. It's easy to download. Yeah. It's very easy to download. And that's nice. And then, Questions arise, hey, how do we do for kids who are accelerating and they're skipping over this eighth grade or what have you? At the very back of Appendix A, it also shows some suggested outlines for an accelerated seventh grade class, an accelerated eighth grade class. <coughs> so that's been helpful for me. What, what do I have to stop doing? Where do I find space in my 180 school days to get to more of this, which I feel is more important for overall learning, than just like, oh, here's this other random I think that's what it means. The race theorems. Go through and, and find some of those things that, uh, that are extra that I just feel like I need to be doing the book says, here it is, do this. I'm going to have to give up a that you are comfortable with the calculations you may have been making, the tools you were using, that might need to be much more formalized, wrapped up with, with, with the, our students. They're, they, they don't have the inside knowledge that we all have. We're just kind of going forward, yeah, 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 yeah. So it might take much more of a wrap up, um, conclusion statement, to make sure people are on the right page with calculations that they're trying to apply, the data that they're using. We're spoiled here because we have all of you folks with your insider knowledge. 
Um, for anyone who's thinking, this is, this is still a little, a little frightening. Um, in the, this thought of like, how do I jump to just using some big MEA, modeling eliciting activity, in the December, January edition of Mathematics Teacher. Um, this article appeared, and this was written, actually co-authored by a guy that's right up at Carroll. Some of you may recognize his name, uh, Ted Wendt. Um, and so this is a really nice, it gives an outline, hey, I have a textbook, and my school district isn't going to buy me a new textbook. <laughs> How do I take the tools that I already have? And most of us may know, or maybe the textbook, you've used the textbook before, when the story problems were really pretty lame. This is a nice quick read that gives you some suggestions how to take one of those story problems and tweak it. And I think it goes through actually four different ways how to tweak it to emphasize four different aspects of the modeling cycle. So using a resource you already have, how, how can you make those baby steps pushing yourself towards modeling? We're going to put the PowerPoints in an electronic binder like we did for the launch. So you'll have all the PowerPoints and all the handouts for everything that we do in the next two days in that electric, electronic resource. Okay. Google model eliciting activities. There a lot come up that give you a lot of different types you can try for different math, uh, depending on what area of math you're teaching, that you can find one that would fit into your cur curriculum. Another very exciting thing is all of you are going to be creating an MEA that is, you know, Montana specific that we can put up and have accessible for people. And so when it's Googled, maybe we'll pop up in the next year. <laughs> It's lunch, so I